this is one of the goals that I have wanted in my life for many, many years. So you are going to always be special to me because you're here. A, dream, a speaker has a nightmare of looking out and nobody showing up. And so I am thrilled to death to see you here this morning. I want to share with you for the next few minutes some thoughts, as Nelda said, on restoring womanhood to its highest ideal. And to do this, the basis for our thoughts this morning is going to be found in the book of Philippians, the second chapter, in the 15th verse. Here Paul tells us that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Now, I know that Paul here talks about the sons of God, but I think we realize that he's speaking in a generic sense to also include the daughters of God. And what higher calling can woman who today have than to be that light that shines in a world that has been so darkened by doubt and confusion and sin? You know, light can be such a blessing. It can dispel fear. It can uh, give direction. It gives warmth. And as Christian women, we have that within us to give these things to those with whom we come in contact, and especially our families, our husbands, and our children, as they should look to us for direction and for help. You know, God had a definite purpose in mind for woman when He created her from man. He knew man needed her. Without her, he was only half complete. But with her, he became whole. She was to make him whole physically in order for procreation to occur and for both their physical needs and desires to be met. But she was also to make him complete emotionally and intellectually. A man tends to approach life head first. And a woman tends to approach life heart first. Now, when you take either one of these approaches by themselves, at times you can get a rather distorted view of life. But when you put those two approaches together, you find that you get a fuller picture in order to make decisions and to meet the different situations that you can uh, that can arise in this life. A wise man will realize that it is only with that very, very special woman in his life that he's truly complete. And the wise woman will always strive to be that light to whom those she loves can look for the help and the direction that they need. There are so many forces and influences in this world today that would try to dim that light. You know, there is no question that women are intelligent and that intellectually, I think we're able to probably do any job that a man can do intellectually. In fact, as wives and mothers, the roles that we carry and the roles that we fulfill call on us to do so many things that when we really stop and think about it, we're pretty expert at a lot of different fields. For instance, we have to know how to balance the budget. We have to know how to uh, uh, tell people what to do and when to do it, how to do it. We are mediators. We promote peace. We make laws. We enforce those laws. All these different things have, uh, in so much we're called upon to do this, that uh, Irma Bombeck, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with her writing, she's made the uh, observation that being president is a dead-end job for women, that we're ready for something at a higher entry level. And there may be some truth to that. But as women and as Christian women, we must realize that in the many roles that we have to fill and the many responsibilities that we have, we want to always look to God that we are filling those roles and meeting those responsibilities in a way that he would have us to, so that our lives are continuing to shine. How do we, as Christian women, keep our light shining? 
so that others can see and glorify God by our lives. How can we restore womanhood to its very ideal? Well, I think we realize that the essence of it is this, that Christian womanhood can only shine as brightly as the glow that's produced by each individual woman who is willing to work at keeping her light shining. If any of you have ever flown on a commercial airline, you may remember that at the very beginning of the flight, the stewardess was up front and she was, would explain or at least demonstrate some of the emergency equipment and emergency techniques on that plane. And one of the things that she would describe to you was that in the event of an emergency, an uh, oxygen mask would fall from the ceiling above your head and you were to take that mask and secure it on your face. But they said that if anyone was traveling with you, like for instance, small children or someone who was going to need assistance in putting an oxygen mask on, they said before you try to assist anyone else with their mask, be sure to secure your own mask first. And at first that may seem a little bit selfish until you stop and realize that you are really not going to be able to be of any real assistance to anyone else if you yourself cannot breathe. So as Christian women, I think this can be true about our own lives. We cannot be that light and that guidance for someone else if we ourselves have let our light go out. I cannot help you to grow if I have to growing myself. So I want us to take a lesson from something that Luke tells us in the second chapter of Luke in verse 52. Well, he tells us how Jesus grew, and I think as Christian women, we'll find that we can also fly from this very same growth pattern in our own lives, because there, in a very familiar verse, Luke tells us that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man, and this represents a very well-rounded life. These are the areas that we as mothers want our children to grow in. We want them to grow healthy in all of these different respects. We want them to grow intellectually. We want them to grow physically. We want them to grow spiritually. And we want them to grow socially. And so this morning, I want to look with you and share with you some thoughts on how we can continue to grow in these aspects and in these areas. You know, when you're young, when you're a child, you carry around this thought that someday I'm going to grow up. And I think sometimes in our minds, we tend to think that it's just one day. All of a sudden, some morning, I'm going to grow up and I'll be grown. I'll have grown up. Well, as we, uh, those of us who have grown up, I think we probably testify to, it doesn't really work that way. Yes, you do finally reach a point in your life, in your physical growth, where you reach a height and you stop there. You may not grow any taller. But I think it's one of the saddest things I've ever found is when someone stops growing in every other way. We never want to really stop growing. And these are the areas that I'm hoping this morning these will help us to see that if we'll work at these areas of our lives, then our, we will continue to grow and our lights will continue to shine. First of all, Mark Luke tells us that Jesus grew in wisdom. And though I discuss a number of different things in the book, I only have time this morning to share just a couple of them with you, two or three. But one of the ways that I think is essential for us to be able to grow in wisdom is going to be through a very effective prayer life. This is the way that Jesus lived his life on this earth as successfully as he did. Now, I know we often think that he had such divine intervention that he really didn't live it like you and I do, but ladies, he really did. And if you wanted an interesting uh, challenge to you to take the Gospels, Mark and Mark, Luke and John, go through them sometimes, just picking out the different times that it mentions that Jesus prayed. That's such a short phrase that it's often lost on us, but... I want you to take the time sometimes to just look, and you're going to be surprised, I think, at how many times it's recorded for us that Jesus prayed. 
And this is one of the reasons he lived this life so successfully is that he was in constant communication with his father. He talked to his father. And that same father he talked to is your father and my father. And he wants us to talk to him just as much as we want to be to talk to him. And he can work just as effectively in our lives as he worked with his. We just all don't always use that, that great blessing to the extent that we should and that we could. Jane McWhorter, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with, she's written some excellent books, uh, recently wrote an article that I was reading where she said she was standing at her kitchen window one day and looked out and noticed that up the trunk of one of her trees, some ivy was beginning to just grow very profusely and it concerned her because she really didn't want that ivy growing up the trunk of that tree. She said her first thought was to go get a ladder put it up against that tree and climb it and start yanking at all those vines that she didn't want uh, uh, on that tree. And then suddenly she, had it, she realized that she didn't need to do that. That was such a precarious thing to do. But rather, really, all what she needed was just a pair of scissors. And she said that that's what she did. She got her scissors and she went out and she just made some slips in some very special places along that vine toward the base of that tree. And that's all it took because in so doing, she kept those vines off from their source of nourishment. And after a little bit, they just withered up and died and fell off that tree. Well, ladies, that is a, there's a lesson for you and me in that example. Because when we don't utilize prayer in our lives, we too are cutting ourselves off from the nourishment that we need to feed us spiritually, from the strength and the guidance that we need to live this life successfully. Also, it will be most difficult for us to teach our children and, and our grandchildren to have an effective prayer life if we ourselves have never learned the power in prayer. Another thing I want us to think about is the fact that we need to be careful what we think about. Watch what you think. Paul has many, many admonitions of telling us in the scriptures what we should think and how we should think. And if time permitted today, I would like to share each one of those with you. But since time doesn't, I think we can sum them all up in probably one sentence, what he admonished us to do. And that was to accentuate the positive and eliminate the negative. This is what we need to work on in our lives. And I realize at times negative thinking can be a rut that we can certainly find ourselves falling into. And recently, I read an article that really made me stop and think, and I want to share some of it with you this morning. It was entitled, Me, a Nag, and it was written by a mother who had a teenage daughter. And one day, after listening for a while to that daughter gripe and complain, she finally turned to her, and half-jokingly, she said, you know, you're going to make a great nagging wife someday. And then she said, I stopped and I thought and I added, I've taught you well. And she said, I suddenly realized I really had. She said, I, without realizing it, had taught my daughter how to be a nag. She said, I had taught her to gripe and complain. And she said, I suddenly realized that if I wasn't very careful, she was going to carry this bad habit with her from then on. And she said, you know how I know she is? It's because her very words and her tone of voice were mine. Now she said, in the past, any time I would hear someone mention a nagging wife, I had this picture that would come into my mind. And I think a lot of us have the same picture. She said, I always thought of it as being someone ugly, Someone who wore rollers, those pink foam rollers in her hair, you know, and wore these house shoes that looked like two dead rabbits and talked like Edith Bunker. Now she said, that was a name to me. And she said, I'm not like that. But then she said, you know, when I talk to my husband, what I say to my husband is for his own good. He needs to be reminded. He needs to be. I'm just trying to be helpful. Well, after telling herself that, she decided to go to the dictionary and see what Webster said. The kind of definition he gave to the idea of nagging. 
And she found words like annoying by continual scolding, fault finding, pestering. She said, I looked and looked and I never did find helpful in there. And then she realized that the Bible had something to say about nagging too. Something like in Proverbs 27, 15, where it says, a continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. Drip, drip, drip. Nag, nag, nag. So she said she realized that actually what she had said in turn to her daughter turned out to really not be a funny matter after all. And so she said right then she apologized to her daughter for the bad example that she had been setting for. And I think all of us need to watch this probably in our own lives because negative thinking is going to come out in negative words. A negative attitude is going to shine forth sometimes just as much as a positive one will. So in the shining that we are going to let our lights do, we want to be sure that it's a positive life that we're giving off and not a negative, and especially those who are the closest to us. Another thing I want us to think about in growing in wisdom is to focus on what is unseen. I think Paul in the fourth chapter of 1 Corinthians and in the latter part of verse 18 gives us a, a motto, you might say, that Christian women can, can draw from and really ought to uh, consider. Um, we ought to, might ought to make a, a sample of this and put it on a sampler of this and put it on a wall sometimes because there he tells us that the things that are seen are temporal or temporary, but the things that are unseen, they are eternal. I want you to think with me for just a minute back to the home that you grew up in as a child, as a teenager. What are the things that you remember most about that home? Was it a freshly mopped kitchen floor or maybe bookshelves with no dust on them? You kind of doubt it. More than likely, what you remember about the home you grew up in was how much you loved being there, how comfortable you felt there, the warmth and the love that dwelt there, and how really, how truly happy you were there, the happy times you spent. The things that are unseen are what we remember so much more sometimes than the things that Offering. And the truly wise woman will strive not to allow what is seen to occupy the most important part of her time and attention, but rather will give care to developing what is unseen, those inner qualities of a spirit-filled life that produces the proper atmosphere for what is truly, truly lasting. This mother who had been teaching her daughter to be a nag said that she began to realize that instead of praising her husband for all the good things he did do, it seemed like the only things that ever came out of her mouth were, why didn't you pick up your shoes? And she said, listen to me, you think picking up his shoes was the most important thing in life. And she said, I started asking myself, a year from now, is it really going to matter? Is it worth making that big a deal over Ten years from now, is it really going to matter? No, she said she decided she did not want to become a nag, that she instead should be thankful that she had someone there to even leave the shoes out. Because someday, she might be gone and those shoes would be empty. It kind of works on the perspective that we use. The godly woman, the wise Christian woman, or strive to concentrate her attention more on who she's becoming than what she's got to do that day. Secondly, we find that Jesus grew in stature, and this is growing physically. And of course, our, we are bombarded nowadays with all types of ways to help us stay healthy. And as Christians, we should be interested in those things. It is our responsibility to keep our bodies physically fit as much as it is to the best of our ability. It, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit at one time dwelt in a building set on a hill in Jerusalem, but it's not there anymore. 
Rather, it dwells in you and it dwells in me. And we do have a responsibility to take care of the building, quote unquote, that God has given to house that spirit. We are told so much about needing exercise to keep that spirit, I mean, to keep that body uh, physically fit. You still see people out running and jogging. How many movie stars have made videos telling us how to exercise? And there's aerobic classes. There's so many diets out, I can even begin to name all of them. And some of them work and some of them don't. None of them work if you don't stay on them. And so uh, it's one of these challenges we have today to, to really try to keep our body fit. And as important as that is, we don't want to stop there. We must realize that we also want to keep ourselves mentally and emotionally stable and healthy. That's just as important. And ladies, we all know that we live in very stress-filled times. The pace that many of us go at, stress is just something that has almost become a way of life with us. I work for the American Cancer Society now. I've been there two and a, uh, about almost two and a half years. And on some of our uh, directors' desks from time to time, I see books, and invariably, if not all the books, at least some of the books that's on their desk is going to have something to say about trying to handle stress. In fact, this Friday, just as I was leaving, I noticed this thick book on one of our directors' desks that was called Stress Management. And I thought at the time, you know, there may be some really good ideas in those books in handling stress, but if what's in those books is not Bible-based, it's really not going to work because God has given us, and as Christian women, we have an advantage in this area of handling stress. Not that we can eliminate stressful situations. We can't. Satan's around, and he's going to throw them in our way for sure. But we don't have to, if we use God's guidance, let those situations be something that destroy us physically, mentally, and emotionally. Scriptures such as Romans 8, 28, and any of you who've ever had me as a teacher for any length of time know how partial I am to that verse, and I guess the reason I am is because I know how true it is. I've seen it happen over and over in my own life. That if we are God's child and we are truly called and letting him call us according to the purpose he set out for us, that he can work things for good in our lives, even when Satan throws things at us that at the time, they seem bad. If we'll just give God time and look for that, that he, we will see how much he can work for good. I have seen him take so many situations in my own life that seemed bad at the time, and he has worked them out. Situations that I really couldn't see how they could ever even be worked out. And I've seen him do it. And thus, as I meet situations today, it gives me strength and courage to know that if he could, could do it in the past, he can do it now, and he can do it in the future. And I don't doubt that. And that in itself is a deterrent to stress. Also, in what Jesus tells us in the sixth chapter of Matthew, how that if we keep our priorities straight and put God in his proper place in his kingdom, that he will see to our needs. If you've never tested God on that, maybe you should. Because he really means what he says. And I could spend an hour up here telling you different ways from experiences in my own life, and I feel sure you could share some with me as well. At times that I've seen this happen so many times, and at times it was almost like he wrote a check and left it in the mailbox. It's just that phenomenal at times. Our God is real, and our God loves his children. If we'll just have the faith to give him a chance to work in our lives, he really will, and he really, really can. Thirdly, Jesus grew in favor with God. And truly, ladies, we, I think, realize that this growing in favor with God will encompass every aspect of our lives as Christian women. It really is at the very heart of restoring womanhood to its highest ideals. It's got to be where we make God the very center of our lives. It's going to be showing and developing such an awesome respect for God and such a reverence for God that it's seen in our day-to-day -day living. And in essence, ladies, this is the definition of godliness, as we talk about in the scriptures. It's not so much becoming godlike, even though 
there are admonitions to that effect in the scriptures, that's really a better definition of holiness than it is godliness. Because the true essence of godliness is the way we approach God, the reverence, the awesome respect that we show to God. And it's going to be seen not just when I have my head bowed in prayer or when I'm in some type of a worshipful assembly. It's going to be seen in every aspect of my life. It's going to be seen in the way we act. It's going to be seen in the way we think, in the way we talk, in the way we dress. It's a fantastic attribute for us to ourselves to realize and then to teach our children is this beautiful quality of godliness, this respect that is going to affect every part of my life. In the Sermon on the Mount, in what we commonly call the Beatitudes, Jesus makes a statement that we're all familiar with when he tells us that the uh, pure in heart will see God. And recently I read an observation that I has really stuck in my mind that I want to share with you, and it may have been shared with you before and, and other times, but that there is so much truth in that, that the pure in heart will see God, because the pure in heart will see God in everything. Now that may be a little bit of a new twist to that thought, but I think it has definite validity, because it's true. The godly woman will have a pure heart that can see God in every situation. She is ever aware of his presence and his ability to work in her life. Here's a line from a poem that I think beautifully illustrates this thought, and this is the way it goes. It says, there's never a day when God forgets, and there's never a time. He doesn't care. Lastly, we want to look at that we must grow in favor with man. Once there was a very bad train wreck, and people were hurting and dying all around in the debris. And there was a doctor who had been on that train and fortunately had not been injured. And he was out walking around. And he could be heard to say, my instrument, my instrument, where are my instruments? I wonder if God ever looked down in this old hurting and dying world and could be heard to cry, my instrument, my instrument, where are my instruments? And ladies, we as Christians, have the wonderful opportunity that we can be those instruments to help a, a world that is hurting and dying. As Christian women and wives and mothers, we have wonderful opportunities that begin within our own family, seeing to the needs of our family, the needs of our neighbors down the street. Within our own congregations, there may be people that need you and need what you and you alone can do. You know, one of the most beautiful instruments I think we can be is using our ability to build self-esteem in other people. So often, a person's self-esteem hinges on what they think you think of them. And I might challenge you today to just think of some people, maybe in your own congregation. Because I know that there are those who don't necessarily see themselves in the highest of life. It may be that those closest to them tend to be these negative type people that tend to dwell more on what's negative in them than on what's positive in them. And maybe you have the insight to realize that inside that person is truly a very beautiful person. That there is so much of beauty to see about them. So much that's good to see about them. So much that is very, very precious. And one of the things that you might strive to do is to take it upon yourself to try to help that person see themselves through your eyes. Because you may be the only positive force 
that they're being they're coming in contact with. It may be parents who tend to accentuate the negative instead of the positive in their children's lives. It may be a, a wife or a, a husband that the family that they're members of tend to be so much more negative about them than positive about them. They may need you in a very, very special way if you are blessed with being able to see the beauty that maybe others haven't seen, help them to see themselves through your eyes. Mm -hmm. The story is told, and if you've read my books or even heard me speak different times, you're going to recognize some of these illustrations I'm going to use, but they're very, very favorites of mine, and, and I love to use them. They've meant so much to me. But the story is told of a little girl who her family had the preacher over one day, and she was wanting to talk to him. She was trying to make conversation, and so finally she asked him, do you like dolls? And he said, yes, I like dolls. And she said, good, I'll go get mine. So she left the room, and she gone for a little bit, and when she comes back, she's just loaded down with all kinds of dolls of every shape, size, and description, and she begins to show him each one and tell him a little about each one. And finally, he asked her, he says, well, now, which one of these dolls do you like best? And she stopped, and she looked at him, and she said, which one do I like the best? He said, yes, which one is your favorite doll? And she said, I'll go get her. And she left the room, and she came back with this old, dirty, dirty doll. And the preacher looked at it, and she handed it to him, and he kind of picked it up gingerly, and he noticed that the dress was kind of torn, and one arm was dangling kind of precariously. And he looked at it, and he said, this is your favorite doll? And she said, yes. Yeah. And he said, but why? Why do you love this doll so much? And she said, because if I don't love that doll, nobody will. And ladies, it very well may be that with some people that you come in contact, you may be the only light they see in a very dark world. And if you don't love them, nobody will. The beauty and the significance of womanhood, someone has described in this way. If motherhood and womanhood stay up, civilization cannot go down. If womanhood slips, then everything slips. Men may slip, but an anchored womanhood will bring them back into line. A womanhood that is lifted anchor brings everything. This is the responsibility we have. Your influence as a woman can never be understated. And though there will be many people who will influence your life and the lives of your family, the most significant influence on your husband and the most significant influence on your children is going to be you. What will you lose with them? Will they always make sure that the fork is on the left side of the plate and the toothpaste tube is squeezed from the bottom because of you? Or will they always love and serve God and their fellow man because of you? No task is too menial and no expression of love and caring too small or to have a very positive effect on your family. One time a young mother was talking to a preacher and she told him that she often described her role as uh, of being a wife and a mother and taking care of her children and her family as staying with the baggage. And he looked at her kind of funny and she said it came from the Bible, that thought. And it turns out it's in First Samuel, the 30th chapter, in verse 24. And there it says, For as his share is, he goes down to the battle, so shall his share be, he stays by the baggage. And the context of this is King David insisting that the home guard be rewarded equally with those who had the more obviously essential role of fighting on the front lines. 
And this mother said that she felt that when she was taking care of her home and taking care of her children, that she was like the home guard and that she too, in staying with the baggage, should be able to speak and be able to be given the same rewards as those who were out in the limelight and, and out fighting maybe in the in the big, the home front there, that she was just as important if she was staying with the baggage. So ladies, I want you to not ever let anyone make you feel inferior as a wife or a mother if there seems to be a lack of great accomplishments in your life. You know, nowhere in God's Word does it ever command women to go out and do something great for the Lord. Now, if He has blessed you with the ability to do great things and gives you the opportunity to do great things, use them, for sure. But realize that what is actually commanded in the Scriptures for women as wives and mothers to do is basically to take care of the necessities of life. To the keepers at home, Bring up and train children, show hospitality, do good work, things of this nature. That's what's there. And if you're doing those things, then you too are staying with the baggage. And you will also be able to receive your rewards right along with anyone who may be more in the limelight. What you're doing is every bit as important. In conclusion, ladies, there is a story that I want to share with you that, again, you may have heard me do before, but it is my absolute favorite. I can't tell you how much it's meant to my life. That I think sums up the essence of what we're striving for when we want to restore womanhood to its highest ideal. And this is a story about a lady's Bible class that was studying, oddly enough, from the Old Testament. And even stranger still is the fact they were studying the book of Malachi. You ever studied Malachi in any of your ladies' classes? I haven't. <laughs> Never taught Malachi. But this is what they were studying. And when they came to the third chapter and the third verse, they read there where God sits as a refiner and purifier of silver watching over Israel. And the class studied that and thought about it and really tried to figure out why Malachi used that word imagery, that word picture, why God chose that imagery to describe him watching over Israel, that of a silversmith, watching the and purifying of Israel. Finally, one lady was so intrigued with it that she decided she was going to visit a silversmith shop to see if she could come to a deeper understanding of what was meant by that verse. So that's exactly what she did. And as she entered the silversmith shop, she saw the silversmith peering intently over a large cauldron of hot liquid silver. And when she walked in, he never raised his eyes, never took it off what he was doing. And she quietly walked in, and after watching him for a little bit, she finally broke the silence and she asked him, she said, do you have to watch the silver that intently? And without raising his eyes, he said, yes. If I don't watch it very, very carefully, then during the purification process, it may get too hot and the silver will be destroyed. So she pondered on that for just a little bit and she thought, that's it. That is what God wanted us to see from that analogy. The situations and trials and temptations in them, this life, God allows, but all the time, He's watching. And these things are meant to purify our lives, but He watches so that it never gets so hot that it would destroy. And she decided that must be it. That must be what God was wanting us to see in that, using that. So since the silversmith was so busy, she decided she'd just go ahead and leave and not bother him anymore. But as she turned to go, the silver smith suddenly spoke again. And this is what he said. He said, I'll know when the purifying process is complete, when I can see my own reflection in the silver. And ladies, restoring womanhood to its highest ideal 
will be accomplished only when Christian women grow as Jesus grew and let their light shine so that when others look at them, they glorify God. And when God looks at them, he sees Christ. Thank